in the fall of 1885, Norwegian, as we had just heard, Norwegian mariner Johann Adrian Jakobsen began a tour of Germany with nine New Hulk people from central British Columbia, seen here in the back. The group gave a special performance for, in Berlin for ethnologists, including Franz Boas, who was helping catalog Jakobsen's recent collection from the North Pacific at Berlin's Royal Museum. Boas's time with the New Hulk in Berlin allowed him to see masks in use and to start writing about coastal cultures. He later credited this formative encounter for his conversion from Inuit to Northwest Coast studies. He said, quote, I divined what a wealth of thought lay hidden behind the grotesque masks and the elaborately decorated utensils of these tribes, unquote. The following, oh, this is on auto advance. Um, the following summer of 1886, Boaz set off on his first field trip to British Columbia. Boaz's work on indigenous art comprised one of his major contributions to anthropological theory and museum practice. The 1887 book featured his most extensive discussion of Kwakwakiwaka art, although it was framed in terms of typological classification rather than aesthetics. The book, illustrating over 200 museum objects, appeared at a crucial transition in Boaz's career, the end of his first decade of independent fieldwork in BC and the start of his curatorial stint at the American Museum of Natural History. In this short paper, I discuss Boaz's groundbreaking but uneven treatment of museum collections in the book, the role of the book in the development of his mature anthropology of art, and how our collaborative critical edition project is using Hunt's archival notes to reactivate some of the book's artworks according to Kwakwakiwak cultural ontologies and genealogical connections. Although Boaz focused his 1886 field trip on linguistic survey, he wrote of his intention to, quote, study the masks in connection with the traditions, that is, the folklore, and he made his own small collection for Berlin in order to cover his travel costs. He took drawings, his own drawings, of the Jakobsen collection, as well as of pieces in London and New York that he made en route. In Victoria, he met one of his New Hulk friends from Berlin and, quote, showed him my drawings from various museums. It was soon apparent that they will be very useful, he wrote. Boaz and Hunt routinely used these drawings as a prompt for recording related legends, songs, dances, and crest privileges. Right from the start, Boaz emphasized the historical diffusion of forms, especially through marriage exchange, and the need to link objects to hereditary narratives and to their specific local ceremonial and discursive contexts, forays into his initial, uh, in his initial assault on evolutionary explanations for cultural development, for example, in his famous 1887 debate with Otis Mason in the Pages of Science, where Boaz clearly laid out his idea of cultural relativism the year before he met George Hunt. You'll see a little yellow star in my slides indicate original materials that are in the exhibition. Boaz published many articles based on his first brief fieldwork. When masks are mentioned, they are treated as exemplars of crests or ancestral legends or as props for hereditary dances, not as art per se. His first real analysis of regalia came in his 1890, uh, 1890 article on the use of masks and head ornaments, which was illustrated with material he sold to Berlin. Boaz discussed the way visual art is entwined with social structures, both hereditary and a final. Importantly, he declared his failure to record much information based on his drawings due to a combination of factors. One, poor collection records, like Jakobsen's own, that left out the object's specific lineage or village of origin. Two, secret and proprietary knowledge closely guarded by object owners. And three, widespread borrowing of forms without the adoption of explanatory narratives, a theory of diffusion that Levi-Strauss later borrowed in his book, The Way of the Masks. Here, Boaz articulated the political and ontological status of ritual objects on the coast, and he resolved to be diligent in collecting masks and narratives as mutually corroborating units of cultural knowledge and practice. And he uh, would soon attempt this very thing with Hunt at the Chicago World's Fair, as we just heard. That summer of 1893 at the fair, and again the following year, Boaz wrote to the Berlin Museum requesting additional drawings he received detailed watercolor sketches by Albert Grunvedel, a museum ethnologist, many featuring Jakobsen's basic collection data. Some of these are now covered with Boaz's own field notes, providing identifications for the objects and their iconography, 
references to legends or performance contexts, and related, uh, related song texts, and information on owners and marriage transfers. At some point after 1894, Boaz returned to Berlin to enter this information on the museum's catalog cards and to integrate them into his 1897 figure, uh, book's figure captions. For instance, Boaz's own drawings here on the upper right on this mask have no information on them, but Grunbettel's later paintings are covered with Boaz's notes that name the band and the lineage with rights to this mask, as well as song lyrics for it. And I think Reiner will return to this mask. The 1897 book maps this information without the ownership data and adds a musical score, likely as a result of recording the tune at the Chicago World's Fair. In 1897, Bo, as the new curator at the American Museum, also launched the Jessup North Pacific Expedition. He began to focus on decorative art and its potential to give access to symbolic dimensions of culture. Among the Kwakwakiwak, both he and Hunt commissioned a large number of drawings of face paintings unique to specific dancers, of ceremonial scenes, and of crest and house front designs, like the one on the left here by an artist named Hithamas, who has a drawing in the exhibition and whose great grandson um, led the singing that opened the exhibition a couple days ago. Some of these illustrated, um, some of these drawings illustrated Boaz's first systematic treatment of the decorative arts in an 1897 museum bulletin, a page of which you see from the right, on the right. Here, here, Boaz <laughs> describes the diagnostic traits of specific crest animals and the application of designs to various media. Boaz argued that a degree of abstraction resulted from both aesthetic conventionalization and the adaptation of the graphic system to multiple object forms and materials. He thereby countered the dominant tendencies in evolutionary theory to explain abstraction as a byproduct of racial degeneration or as a direct expression of early, that is totemic, um, stages of cultural development under those theories. However, defining the visual features of crests as iconographic types took precedence over the identification of specific objects as indexical hereditary tokens there's no link made here between decorative motif and restricted ownership. Aesthetics is divorced from sociology and politics. That same year, Boaz published his uh, illustrated Social uh, Secret Societies book. The volume was a groundbreaking attempt to document the social and cultural terms by which indigenous art is meaningful to its own makers and users. Here, Boaz neither treated ornamented objects as the aesthetic achievement of individual creative minds, as he would later, nor did he provide extended analysis of particular artworks. Rather, the numerous objects and captions literally illustrate Boaz's otherwise largely textual account of Kukwakiwak social organization and ceremonial practice. Figures and plates are rendered from three source media, photographs, pencil sketches, most by Boaz, and ink drawings by museum staff, and they fall into three categories, those clearly identified by their repository or their collector, museum items lacking repository IDs, and objects shown in the context of use. The bulk of extant objects are at the Ethnologisches Museum Berlin, having been collected around 1881 by Jakobsen, many with Hunt's assistance, or by Boaz in 1886. This is the world's earliest large Kokokiwa collection since many items in it were looted by the Soviets at the end of World War II and only returned to Berlin in 1994, they've been largely accessible and unstudied until quite recently. Many items pictured in the book were drawn from the US National Museum, which published the monograph in its annual report for 1895. Boaz relied on early collections by James Swan and William Dahl for many of the comparative non Kwakwakiwak objects they acquired along the coast between the 1840s and 1880s, like the bowl you see on the left. The majority of Kwakwakiwak ceremonial objects, like the mask on the right, were purchased by Boaz and Hunt themselves during and after the 1894 winter ceremonial they attended together in Fort Rupert. This set is the only, this is the only set of objects in the book whose initial documentation and detailed captions approximate Boaz's ideal of recording rich ethnographic data for museum collections at the time of sale, as opposed to retroactively. 
With the next two major collections, the book mostly fails to identify the current repositories. At the American Museum here in New York, four objects were drawn, were drawn by Boaz um, on prior field trips and previously published. These were, the, these were only accessioned by the museum um, during the subsequent Jessup expedition after the book was published. With two exceptions, the pictured objects in New York were collected by Boaz and Hunt themselves between 1895 and 1900. Boaz certainly knew at the time that the second set of objects was at the Chicago's Field Columbian Museum, but he curiously captioned most of them from a sketch uh, or from sketches made at the World's Columbian Exposition, which is in fact one of the only nods to the World's Fair in the whole book. And my theory is that Boaz was um, sticking it to the Field Museum for not hiring after the fair. Um, almost all of these were purchased by Hunt for display at the fair itself. In addition, the Field Museum now holds regalia worn or used by dancers pictured in the book plates that were derived from photographs taken at the fair, as Ira will discuss shortly. However, it's not clear whether Hunt acquired these objects prior to the fair or whether they were purchased directly from the performers who brought them themselves. The small balance of objects is scattered among 10 uh, museums in Europe and North America, most collected or transferred between museums in the 20th century. For example, uh, this carved frontlet attributed to the Haida artist Simeon Stilfta and worn by Guayutlalas at the fair was collected in British Columbia in 1939 by the surrealist artist Wolfgang Palin, who published it from Mexico in his famous 1943 essay on Northwest Coast Art, and it's now at the Brooklyn Museum. A few regalia items and house posts pictured in public, published sketches or photos may have been collected after 1897, but we haven't located them yet. Boaz deployed uh, material culture to illustrate three aspects of his ethnographic narrative. The first and last chapters of the book situate the Kokohiwak among their coastal neighbors, with regional artworks allowing comparison of social and ceremonial organization more than art styles per se. Four early chapters focus on the potlatch and kinship and feature house fronts and posts, feast dishes, and masks displaying the heraldic crests of particular kin units that are tied to related songs and ancestral charter narratives. The bulk of materials illustrate seven chapters on the winter and other seasonal ceremonials, the pantheon of initiating spirits, and the hereditary dance societies that structure ritual activity, mediate relations with supernatural beings, and confer social prestige. Without outlining uh, stylistic conventions in any detail, Boaz shows that objects long treated as exotic, inscrutable, or generic are in fact highly specialized in their interpretation and restricted in their circulation. However, conspicuously absent with rare exception is the information Boaz and Hunt collected connecting specific masks to owners or lineages. Instead, the objects generally illustrate categories of mask or dance, in this case, the tsunukwa, which we saw danced here the other night, in much the same way that various sub-tribes are conflated under the generic term quakutl. Boaz summarized the status of regalia as the temporary instantiation of hereditary privileges, but he downplayed the notion of masks as property and the importance of genealogy in validating specific material forms. We might see this move from token to type as part of Boaz's larger interest at the time in locating commonly occurring forms like objects, stories, and social structures across geographic space in order to reconstruct their historical development and diffusion. That is to say, he was engaged in canon formation regarding typical objects and styles, the typological impulse of his early survey fieldwork sponsors. Taxonomy was also a key component of the 19th century natural sciences paradigms that informed museum work at the time, even if Boaz rejected its evolutionary undercurrents. Boaz's training in comparative philology may also have prompted him to approach material culture with linguistic models in mind. His classification of objects suggests a kind of syntax or concordance of material forms in which specific object types are grouped according to local native terms. In any case, the book established the standard lexicon still used to classify Kwakwakiwak art. For a decade after 1897, Boaz embarked on an ambitious program for the collection, description, display, analysis, and publication of Northwest Coast art, much of it from, drawn from neighboring groups uh, that were visited on the Jessup expedition. By the time Boaz published Primitive Art in 1927, he was explicit in engaging with luminaries in the field of comparative art, 
including Gottfried Semper, Awa Riegel, Alfred Haddon, and Ernst Gross, among others. He consolidated insights from previous studies to mount a theoretical and methodological critique of evolutionary art history by promoting the creativity and virtuosity of individual artists, the simultaneity rather than progressive development of geometric and representational styles, variability in the diffusion of form and interpretive meaning, and the locally situated nature of historical adaptation and artistic change. Until he died, Boaz continuously dipped back into the 1897 book for examples of Kwakwakiwak art and ceremony that could be used to promote his general anthropological theories of cultural holism and dynamism. As we know now, it was really George Hunt who took up the descriptive flaws in the 1897 book and dedicated the last decade of his life to correcting them. I want to conclude with two brief examples of the ways in which our critical edition project and the Storybox exhibition are using Hunt's emendations to revisit Boaz's foundational work. Regarding a well-known type of mask resembling and thought to have initially been derived from carved images of lions on European ships, Hunt's archival notes on such masks suggest a revision to Boazian typology. In the book, Boaz illustrated a few such masks under the generic category of Nuthamal, or fool dancer, along with others that do not feature this lionine imagery. In his early 1920s corrections, Hunt consistently identified the lion-type masks as depicting sapachais, or shining down sunbeam, a supernatural sky being, and he linked specific masks to different lineages and bands from the Quatsino Sound area of Vancouver Island. In primitive art, Boaz finally allowed that a lack of consensus about the identity uh, lack that there was a lack of consensus about the identity of these masks, which accurately reflects the fact that similar-looking objects can instantiate unique prerogatives in different communities. Current reattribution of these distinct masks may allow its reconnection to particular lineages. In one exciting case, such potential has already been realized. Jakobsen collected this distinctive killer whale transformation mask around 1881, possibly with Hunt's assistance. Boaz pictured the mask in the book's chapter on chiefly dances, but said little about it. In his notes, Hunt identified this mask as having belonged to his first wife, Lucy, and related the story of her initiation with it after having been abducted by a sea monster on the beach in Fort Rupert. This genealogical reconnection led Corrine Hunt to study the mask in Berlin and to carve a new version of it with her cousin David Knox, another Hunt descendant. They finished it last week. Now it's in the exhibit, and one day it will be danced in Fort Rupert again. Far from being an ossified ethnographic text or a simple compendium of salvaged and static museum collections, the 1897 book and its illustrated collections have um, lived an active, mobile, and quite complicated life. Despite his trademark attention to local cultural context and ethnographic detail, Boaz's early typological gestures tended to sever individual artworks from their ontological basis as materializations of hereditary rights. But those genealogical connections were not broken. In some cases, Hunt's archival notes, when combined with oral history and community-based research of the kind that Andy will talk about, um, these notes can reactivate long dormant materials and demonstrate well into the future Boaz's fundamental insight that both, both art and culture, and perhaps anthropology, are in constant flux. Thank you very much. <laughs> I have time just, oh. just, just for one or two quick questions, and then I'll call up our next speaker. Yeah. In the title of his book, he says something about <coughs> secret societies. Why would these indigenous Indians share the details of their secret societies, or is there some suspicion that they didn't really share the details? <laughs> Good question. Um, so, well, let's use the term secret societies, which was common in ethnological cir um, uh, circles at the time. Um, but because um, access, membership in the societies was restricted, by genealogy, so not everybody could participate. And the participants in each of these societies um, had access to certain songs and names and choreographies and ceremonial knowledge that was kept within the bounds of the society. Um, uh, later ethnographers took issue with the term secret societies 
and called them dance societies or fraternal societies. Um, so the, na the nature of the secret knowledge that was um, held by the, the initiated members, um, you know, Boaz uh, identified in some contexts and didn't in others. Many of the people that Boaz and Hunt got information from were initiated members of these societies and the people who did dances at the World's Fair, uh, as much as anyone can tell, were initiated members of their societies um, who had rights to perform them. Um, but the exact nature of their information as secret um, it, it's unclear whether it's a kind of translation error, again, into a kind of et ethnographic category at the time. Um, and they're, I think, more properly considered sort of hereditary um, dance societies. A question at the back? Yeah, um, I am wondering about the possibility of sort of a strategic blurring of certain information, given that uh, these maps and other items were hereditary, and perhaps it was not well accepted or acknowledged to give this information publicly. Um, I'm curious if there's anything like that you've found between hunting and as well as um, Well, like I said in that early essay, Boaz said he had trouble finding, doc documenting, retroactively documenting masks because people would say that I don't have rights to that mask, I can't tell you anything about it. So that led him to the sort of principle of restricted ownership. Um, one of the things our project is doing now is for Hunt's later notes where he provides genealogical information on masks and new identifications, one of the things we're really keen to do and especially Kwakwakiwa community members are keen to do is know who supplied Hunt with that information because for community reconnections to occur, one has to know what the source of information was. So it's generally understood now that Hunt was the source of a lot of Boaz's information. And now the next realm of digging is who were Hunt's sources. And that's why Judith gave the paper that she did. We're trying to figure out who the, ho the, who the sources for Hunt's knowledge were. And Boaz was often very, you know, we know Boaz wrote to Hunt saying, um, I'm not sure you're, what people are selling you is what it really is. Boaz, because he was aware of the kind of proprietary nature of knowledge, he was always on guard for um, um, mistakes, but he sort of arrogantly believed that he could adjudicate those mistakes um, as opposed to Hunt or, or anyone else. So it is a kind of interpretive problem in the present to kind of reconstruct the chain of knowledge transmission that um, should have gone along with the transmission of objects and other. Somehow it would be by not sharing that kind of hereditary information. You mean by having it and not publishing it? Exactly. Come back to that at the end. I think that's going to take more of us to answer than I can, than I can do on my own. Uh, so thanks. With that, we'll hold other questions. And I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Ira Jackness.